-hmm. What's actually happening is there are people who are getting better. Their cancer is shrinking on like MRIs, but they're not taking real medicine. <laughs> okay. So that is staggering. What is placebo? Placebo is just all of the mechanisms of the human body and mind that we yep. do not scientifically understand. Exactly. But placebo actually gets people better. Mm -hmm. In cancer clinical trials, in rheumatoid arthritis clinical trials, depression clinical trials, but that's like waffly because depression is in the mind and it's not really real anyway. But you can look at physical illnesses like diabetes and stuff and you can give people placebo and they actually get better. Yeah. It's mind blowing. It, it is. There are two things of note in this clip. First of all, the placebo effect may help you feel better, but it won't actually get you better. If Dr. K was merely trying to say that the placebo effect can help alleviate certain symptoms, then the reduction in the size of tumors should be the last thing he's talking about here. But since Dr. K says the patients get better and how mind-blowing that is, he makes it sound like you can treat or even cure things like diabetes and cancer with placebo. Second of all, he says depression doesn't exist, which is kind of a weird thing for a clinical psychiatrist to be saying. I've talked about Dr. K on this channel before, but I didn't have enough information to draw a meaningful conclusion. I just pointed out some contradictions, which didn't seem to make much sense. But I was recommended a Healthy Gamer GG video recently and decided to watch it. There were more inconsistencies, so I decided to keep looking into this on a live stream. Someone in chat recommended Chudlogic's video on Dr. K from about a year ago, which is where I got that first clip from. After doing some more research, I think I can finally make sense of the situation. With fresh context, let's go over Dr. K's take on SSRIs and the placebo effect. This is a, a good example of how antidepressant medication, a lot of it seems to be based on belief. So some people even have even hypothesized that 70% or up to 70% of the therapeutic value, the clinical benefit of an antidepressant medication is actually placebo. And only 30% of it is biological. Now, if I say something like that, y'all may be very, very surprised because you may say, well, like, you know, if it's placebo, does that mean that it's not effective and I shouldn't take it? Whereas not necessarily. In fact, what we sort of know is that even if it's placebo, we, we sort of still know that it knows, know that it works. And there are even studies that show that if you tell a patient this is a placebo, but you also tell a patient that placebos lead to clinical improvement, Giving that person that medication, even though they believe it's a placebo, if you tell them, hey, I think this SSRI is going to help you, even if it's a placebo, it turns out that it actually works and it helps them. Before we continue, it's important to note that in this Dr. K video, he was supposed to be focused on a recent study which largely disproved the science behind our understanding of depression and thus the medication. But he instead decides to focus on a 2007 study about the placebo effect. I think what Dr. K says here about SSRIs and the placebo effect could be interpreted in two different ways, although neither of them make much sense. Either A, even in the face of a study against it, even when he doesn't believe in depression in the first place, and even when he acknowledges that the SSRI is largely placebo, he will still recommend you take it. Or B, you should seek out a doctor who's willing to prescribe you a placebo. It's strange that his focus would drift so far from the study the video was supposed to be about in the first place. Another thing I took issue with in my first video is Dr. K's flippant attitude towards addiction and Adderall. But it's okay to take ADHD medication every single day. Sometimes you need your ADHD medication on the weekend as well. Why? Because you have to do all the crap that you don't get to do during the week on the weekend. Like you gotta do laundry, you gotta pick up groceries, you gotta drop off packages to return to Amazon, you gotta, you know, pick up birthday cards, you gotta be on time to social events. So it's fine to use my ADHD medication every single day. So does that mean you become dependent? Well, there's two issues to consider with ADHD medication. The first is that there may be a physiologic dependence. So this is neither good nor bad. It's not a value judgment. It just means that if your body develops a physiologic tolerance and dependence on a particular chemical substance, that means if you don't take it, you're going to have withdrawal symptoms and that could be bad. When patients ask about dependency, they're usually not asking about the morality of the situation. They want to know about the severity and possibility of withdrawal. For a Harvard-trained psychiatrist specializing in addiction, it seems quite irresponsible to downplay withdrawal symptoms as something that could be bad. I don't think anyone has had anything better than a bad time regarding withdrawal. I also think it's a bit much to encourage the use of Adderall for minor errands, but I digress. 
Moving on, this is the video that got me looking into Dr. K again. It's his video on dopamine detox. It's riddled with errors, which we'll go over, but there's one important detail, which I'll save for last. We're going to talk about dopamine detox today. A lot of the things that people struggle with and when people have questions like, how do I build confidence? How do I, you know, let go of past resentment? How do I better understand anxiety? Like, how can I develop like a meditation program to help me with like feelings of depression or inadequacy? All of those questions. So what we actually did is take like the most prominent questions in our community and actually package them together in a really formal way. And that's what Dr. K's guides are. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start with Googling dopamine detox. And this is gonna explain part of the reason why dopamine detox is tough. My point here is that people who are spreading this information do not have so this was like on the front page. So I, granted, I used DuckDuckGo. I don't know exactly what would happen if I used Google. Probably be influenced by my search history. To me, that's a little bit suspicious, especially considering when you Google dopamine detox, it shows a snippet of a website called Game Quitters, which seems to be in direct competition with Healthy Gamer GG. Ideally, he should be talking about the doctor who coined the term dopamine detox in the first place. Instead, we get this. You just remove it. Just remove it, chat. What's wrong? What's wrong with you dumbasses? Just remove it. Just, just log out. Just like food, none. Just don't eat, chat. Just so we're all on the same page, Dr. K is debunking a website that tells its message through Steve Harvey memes. For a video that's called Psychiatrist Debunks Dopamine Fasting, he chose a pretty awful example to debunk. It's about as straw man as it gets. For the next example he uses, he takes a pretty hypocritical and silly angle. So this, this neuroscience seems better, chat. So he talks a little bit about satisfaction, which makes sense. So this is actually like, this is pretty good. Oh, wow, look. Discover the seven proven business models that made me an internet millionaire in less than three years. And he's sitting on a car. Get instant access to free video training and get started. Free four-part video training and he's sitting on a beat. Discover how to make money publishing books on Amazon. This guy is smiling and is wearing a suit. My name is Dr. Alok Kanoja, and you might know me as Dr. K. Mastermind your way towards success. This module is designed to mirror how I actually work with people who are suffering from depression. I'm con- Hmm. I'm getting a little bit distracted by- Investing for beginners. Supplements. How to master your mind and emotions. How to organize, how to prioritize, and how to meditate, obviously. So this is the problem with dopamine detox is like no one knows like what on earth they're talking about. Like, I don't get that this person is, you know, he's, this is great. I mean, this is actually pretty similar to what we do, right, Chad? It's like purpose, vision, spirituality, like neuroscience sprinkled in, like, it's kind of like us. I don't know. To me, it makes perfect sense that a business motivator guy would want to talk about the latest buzzword to help people motivate themselves. After Dr. K debunks both of these web pages, he searches for dopamine detox on WebMD. So this is like the problem with, with a lot of the information about dopamine detox, is that it seems like people just sort of like talk about it, right? But really don't know what they are talking about. So now let's, 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 before we get too far, let's look at like, so let's look at the flip side, right? So if I were to go to PubMed and do a search for dopamine detox, what would I find? Right, so, so first of all, I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, if I do, you should see a bunch of papers, okay? When you search things on PubMed. So if I search for dopamine detox, essentially I find nothing. This is the other problem with dopamine detox, which I want everyone to understand, is that dopamine detox has not actually been studied, okay? So there are not clinical trials on dopamine detox. Why would you expect a buzzword, a recent buzzword, to show up in a PubMed search? So no, dopamine detox hasn't been studied, but dopamine's relationship to behavior has been studied. After discrediting two bad examples of dopamine detox and misrepresenting how much information is surrounding the subject, he then uses information similar to the studies that I mentioned to support the idea of a dopamine detox. Do activities that normal people seem to enjoy seem to like not be very enjoyable to you? If the answer is yes, then you need a dopamine detox, okay? So what we want to do through a dopamine detox is reset our levels because what happens is when I play a video game for 10 hours a day, I'm getting a constant stream of dopamine. That constant stream of dopamine is going to downregulate my dopamine receptors. This also, we don't 
actually hasn't been studied. So this is a clinical observation based on principles of neuroscience. Okay. But there is a study to prove that. Granted, it's about chemical dependence, not video games. But in both cases, we're talking about dopamine and the reward system, both of which have been studied quite a lot. All right, time to bring back that important detail I mentioned earlier. The science that was used to come up with the idea of a dopamine detox in the first place has nothing to do with dopamine. It's based on Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT. The doctor who came up with this idea just thought dopamine detox would be a catchy name, and he was right. This name does lead to some misconceptions, but they're misconceptions that Dr. K should be able to navigate. You know, I guess this guy is an expert at a Amazon publishing? Or dopamine? To add to the irony, CBT is pretty much the core of Dr. K's business model. In this video about debunking dopamine detox, Dr. K does anything but properly represent the original idea of dopamine detox. There's often mixed messaging in Dr. K's videos, but this one has quite a few layers to it. This all could have been avoided if he would have just looked at the article that Harvard published on the topic. You know, the article that's the second result for a Google search of dopamine detox. The mixed messaging gets even worse when he talks about self-diagnosis. So we're seeing a ton of self-diagnosis on the internet, right? Where people will like say, oh yeah, I have autism, I have ADHD, I have this, um, I have multiple personality disorder, things like that. Like people will diagnose themselves with all sorts of things. And is that kind of valid? Well, I know this is gonna sound kind of weird. My short answer is no, it's not. But there's a pretty big but in there as well. In medical practice, self-diagnosis is a big no, especially regarding mental illness. Self-diagnosis is potentially dangerous. While Dr. K does say in this video you shouldn't self-diagnose, his inconcise and unclear messaging leave far too much room for interpretation. This generation is the best generation in terms of, like the digital generation, is the best in terms of being able to find answers for themselves. So we're like more effective at it than any generation prior to us. Um, there's also more high quality information. So as we can see that there are good reasons and good sources to make diagnosis. Now what we're gonna get to is I think the core reason why it's generally speaking not a good idea to make a final diagnosis about yourself. And that's the closest he gets to denouncing self-diagnosis. All right, so what's the big but he was talking about earlier? Big but. What's the exception to the rule? Well, according to Dr. K, it's being able to perform a differential diagnosis, not just a diagnosis. And this is the, the big problem that I see with self-diagnosis is that people don't construct differentials. The implication being, if you do enough research, then you can self-diagnose without consulting a professional or even your parents. Just watch five more Healthy Gamer videos and then start calling yourself ADHD. I know that's not exactly what Dr. K said, but for a viewer seeking help, they could easily interpret this as such. There is no reason to toe the line this much regarding self-diagnosis. Just say it's bad, move on. But what if there is a reason to use such mixed messaging regarding self-diagnosis? So I, I just, this is my point is like people, what, what I think is going on right now when it comes to like information about dopamine detoxes is that like people like this, who seems like he's good at selling stuff, right? So his expertise is in selling and he's like, oh, like this is great. Like people will search for dopamine detox. My website will pop up because he knows about, you know, marketing stuff. And then I will talk a little bit about it. And then presumably he will, people will, purchase my products and services. So this is like the problem with, with a lot of the information about dopamine detox. Although Dr. K is a psychiatrist, he's also an influencer and a marketer. I know he doesn't directly condone self-diagnosis, but his inconcise and unclear language may give hope to a viewer that it is possible. This would entice many viewers to watch the entire video and check out his channel, especially considering how he says what a big relief a diagnosis can be, which, in the context of a video about self-diagnosis, is incredibly inappropriate. So one of the most amazing things about receiving a psychiatric diagnosis, for some people, by the way, for some people, it's stigmatizing, but for some people, it's liberating. Because for some people, I've struggled my whole life and I haven't understood why. Am I cursed? Am I broken? Am I messed up in some way? And for some people, getting a diagnosis is liberating because it offers a, an explanation. Plus, he never really goes over any of the core reasons as to why self-diagnosis is dangerous, or rather, what often makes it inaccurate. The biggest reasons why you shouldn't self-diagnose are personal bias and misconceptions of the self. 
If you tell somebody that a diagnosis can be liberating in the context of self-diagnosis, you are only adding to the bias that gets in the way in the first place because now they're going to be more eager to find a diagnosis. When I start to look at Dr. K as more of an influencer than a psychiatrist, many of the other inconsistencies and blurred lines start to make a lot more sense. Why would he encourage the continued use of SSRIs even in the face of evidence against it? Well, if a good portion of his audience is on SSRIs and thus more likely to click on that video, he wouldn't want to be so blunt as to say the medication you're taking is bogus. So he sugarcoats it. Very heavily. Why would he encourage the daily use of Adderall, which is potentially habit-forming, when he thinks therapy without medication is equally effective as Adderall? Medication and psychotherapy are equally effective, roughly. The symptom reduction that they get in terms of, of ADHD is the same, okay? You don't actually don't need a pill. Well, for his audience who may be taking Adderall, he doesn't want them to feel stigmatized. Why would he put so much doubt around the idea of a dopamine detox only to wind up endorsing the practice? Because it appeals to the widest audience, both the skeptics of dopamine detox and the people looking to practice it. Why would he overstate the power of the placebo effect? Because hope is a great marketing tool. A wholesale approach to mental health can lead to dangerous misconceptions. When you have a high amount of autism traits in kids, their parents reported high levels of gender identity variance. So that means that people with autism are 400% more likely to have issues around gender variance. Um, I'm sure that the good clinicians have figured this out, but for other clinicians who have a more general practice, I think the most important clinical takeaway is that if you have a patient with autism, you should consider evaluating them for gender identity issues. And if you have a patient who's got gender identity issues, you should evaluate them for autism traits. I'll have to lay a little bit of groundwork to explain this one, but I can assure you it's more compelling than prejudice. First, each doctor will have a unique set of bias and problems, which can negatively impact the diagnostic process, and they're often overworked. So one of the biggest mistakes that we make as doctors is that we're arrogant. So what happens is sometimes we'll have patients who come in and they'll say, hey, I think I have cancer. I, the doctor, will ask them a, hand, a handful of questions and I'll, I'll determine, sometimes what'll happen is I'll go through a process called premature closure, where instead of considering a good differential, I'll jump to conclusions and doctors fall into that as well. And then what ends up happening is a lot of times patients don't get listened to and doctors will actually like make diagnoses and jump to conclusions and not actually like listen to or perform appropriate diagnostic workups. And especially when it comes to mental health pra practitioners, like we're all overworked and burnt out. Second, a diagnosis can lead to a sense of hope and liberation. And for some people, getting a diagnosis is liberating because it offers a, an explanation. Third, Dr. K believes that roughly half of the population is alexithymic, which means they struggle with identifying and communicating their emotions. About uh, probably less than 10% of the population is severely alexithymic, which is pretty big. And then like probably, you know, up to 30 to 50% of the population is moderately or mildly alexithymic. I'm not entirely sure about that number. Fourth. Autism presents itself as a communication problem. Not only does this make it difficult to understand what they're feeling, but they're also more susceptible to suggestibility. Fifth, Dr. K puts a lot of faith in patients and viewers to be able to navigate the mental health system. I, I hope, you know, I make this pretty clear that sometimes what I'm saying is very supported by science. Sometimes what I'm saying is more supported by clinical experience. And sometimes what I'm saying is not based on medicine or science at all, but is more personal or spiritual in nature. If a doctor is not talking to you enough, if they are not explaining things enough, then by all means, get a second opinion, explain to them that you need more explanation, and also like, by all means, go see a specialist. Here's what I'm getting at. In a world where doctors are overworked and arrogant, where parents and patients look at diagnosis as a beacon of hope and liberation. In a world where Dr. K believes that half of the population struggles with identifying and communicating their emotions. A world where autistic children are especially agreeable and suggestible. In a world where the mentally ill and those seeking help are expected to be able to navigate the mental health industry. Why would you recommend children as young as seven with autism be evaluated for gender identity issues?
He notes the correlation between autism and gender identity issues and then speculates the causation. But he never considers that maybe arrogant doctors not being able to communicate with their autistic patients is what causes the problem in the first place. If that's the case, then this recommendation from Dr. K is irresponsible. But hey, it allows him to put the keywords autism and gender dysphoria in a pretty catchy title. You know, I make this pretty clear that sometimes what I'm saying is very supported by science. Sometimes what I'm saying is more supported by clinical experience. And sometimes what I'm saying is not based on medicine or science at all, but is more personal or spiritual in nature. And I think a lot of the people that appreciate our community are, are ones that sort of appreciate the spectrum because there are different ways of looking at things. It's hard to say if Dr. K's content is either heavily influenced by the YouTube algorithm or if there's an intention to pander to a specific audience. Even though his mixed messaging may appeal to a wider audience, it defeats the point of a mental health resource in the first place. I was considering going over some of the pseudoscience and Ayurveda stuff, but honestly, it feels like a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of this stuff. So like if you have a Vata mind, you're like an air Pokemon. Wholesale psychiatry is unethical. Understanding your audience and community as a YouTuber and a Twitch streamer is one thing, but when you throw psychiatry as well as unclear and inconcise language into the mix, it's a train wreck. Conflating medical terms and spirituality to appeal to a wider audience does not constitute as mental health awareness. It's potentially dangerous and ought to be called out and corrected. Considering the position that Dr. K is in, he needs to be a lot more careful with his information and how he markets himself. All right, that's going to have to do it for this one. Shout out to the best subscriber squad in all of YouTube. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. I'm confused.